Hello and welcome to the Region Agri podcast, the go-to place to hear everything about regenerative agriculture. Region Agri is an initiative supporting farms, agribusinesses and the supply chain in their transition to regenerative approaches. We offer global capability with the aim of securing the health of the land and the wealth of those who live on it. For more information about our initiative and to find out how we can help you with your regenerative journey, visit regionagri.org. I'm your host, Rose Riley, and once again, I'm excited to bring you the latest developments on the global phenomenon that is regenerative agriculture. In this episode, we're going to delve into all aspects of no-till systems. Limiting soil disturbance is a key principle which is adopted in regenerative farming systems because it can drastically reduce soil erosion, maximise biodiversity within the soil, improve nutrient cycling and enhance water retention. To explore this topic, I'm joined by Dwayne Beck, a professor in agronomy, horticulture and plant science at South Dakota State University, who managed the Dakota Lakes Research Farm for 32 years before retiring very recently. Since its opening, the entire facility at Dakota Lakes has been managed using continuous low disturbance, no-till and diverse rotations. Duane has also developed programmes to support farmers to transition to no-till systems profitably. We're also joined by Blake Vince, who farms 1,200 acres in Ontario, Canada. Blake practices low disturbance and no-till with diverse rotations and livestock integration. Since his dad and uncles first adopted no-tilling in 1983, the Vinces have come to be considered the pioneers of no-till in their corner of Canada. Welcome to the podcast, Dwayne and Blake. Good to be here. Great to be here. It would be really good to get a bit of an idea of your backgrounds. So could we first get an introduction to Dakota Lakes Research Farm? Well, the Dakota Lakes Research Farm is a farmer-owned research facility that was created in actually in the 1980s. The conceptual part of it was uh, it's owned by this not-for-profit corporation in the U.S., so it's the charity And that was put together by farmers because they felt they needed more applied type research. And especially at that time, it was focused on irrigation and making water go into the soil under irrigators because they had fallen into the trap of believing that doing a bunch of irrigation to meet this export demand was a way to make money. Unfortunately, economics such as fuel prices got in there. And so they were really struggling and they set up this research farm so they could control the direction of the research a bit more. They cooperated with South Dakota State University uh, in terms of having a partner that was a scientific home, so to speak. And so it was created and started in 1990 with a lot of focus on making water go into the soil. But By that time, we had already decided it wasn't going to be focused on irrigation as much as on the rain-fed or dry land farming systems where you didn't have access to extra water. And it's been in place since 1990. We've changed the landscape in this area. Before, there was lots of tillage. Now there is none in any of this large area on either side of the Missouri River uh, running through South Dakota. It's it's an area that's bigger than the country of Ireland, so to speak. So <laughs> very large area that has been impacted, switched almost entirely to no-till and diverse rotations and the irrigation that was there has gone away. And uh, I had a young woman from Bulgaria with me last Saturday. We went through much of that area. She's with the no-till organization in Bulgaria. And she asked me what was the touchstone that we used to know that the system was working, because we talk about this very complete system of not only no tillage, but also high diversity, livestock integration, high diverse rotations, that kind of stuff. And I said, well, the first thing I look at is farmers building more grain bins or silos because that means they're successful. And then the next thing I look at is how old the machinery is that they use and whether they have a brand new shed to put the machinery in. And then the last thing I look for is a new house. And if they build a new house on the farm, then we know that they've been very, very successful. So, (laughs) and she was waiting for all these things about soils and whatever, but if the system is working, the soil isn't blowing and they're more productive and, and they start putting infrastructure back into the system. Fantastic. And um, Blake, can we get an introduction to your family farm? Well, certainly. So our farm is located approximately one hour drive away from Detroit, Michigan in deep southwestern Ontario, Canada. And so we're one hour east of Detroit and we're three hours west of Toronto, Ontario, 
And we're right down in the southern corner of Canada. We'd be straight across Lake Erie from Cleveland, Ohio, to give everybody sort of a visualization of where we're located on the map. So we're down here surrounded by the Great Lakes in this Great Lake chain that people are familiar with. So we have lots of fresh water. So we're sort of a maritime climate, almost the opposite of Dr. Beck in the Dakota Lakes where they're more arid. We tend to be a little more humid at times through the winter months, uh, ironically or coincidentally, even though we are surrounded by the fresh water, the Great Lakes, that is, we were very dry this summer. We had experienced a, quite a prolonged drought. So it is uh, one of those things where no-till has definitely helped us, but it's not provided a band-aid as it were. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but definitely it has gone a long way to allow us to produce a crop. You know, those are the joys of farming. So it's providing some resilience in times when things don't necessarily work 100% in your favor, especially in a rain-fed environment. Fantastic. We hear a lot on this podcast about how regenerative approaches can build resilience on farms. So it's nice to hear that you're experiencing that as well. So I'd love to know from both of you what regenerative farming actually means to you. Regenerative ag to me is a term we've used for a while. Unfortunately, it's it's being misused in a lot of the world now because it's a hot new topic. Most of the farming systems descriptions are based on inputs. Conventional tillage means you're doing tillage. Uh, no till even means that you're just not doing tillage it's based on what you're doing for input. Organic is really based on this kind of traditional idea of what you can't use. You can't use anything new uh, and modern. But what I see regenerative being is something that we focus the definition on outcomes. And so it's based on how does your system cycle nutrients? If it doesn't cycle nutrients like they would have been cycled by the ecosystem prior to agriculture, then it's not regenerative. You've got to mimic that nutrient cycle and you've got to mimic the water cycle. If you're putting in artificial drainage or using irrigation, for instance, you're not mimicking the native ecosystem that was there. The other one that's real key is the energy cycle. How well are you managing the energy cycle? If we look at the common rotations used in the U.S. Corn Belt or even in the Wheat Belt or in the U.K. in Europe, they harvest sunlight for only very short periods of time in the year. And corn soybean, for instance, it's only a few months out of 12 that you're harvesting that energy. And then the third part of that is how well do you mimic the diversity that was there? Initially, do you have that same scale of diversity? We had the bison and those type of things. Well, we're putting the cattle back to try to mimic some of that. Some of our guys are actually doing bison. So it really is more of a output-based or outcome-based system. And so I challenge a lot of people that use the word, well, you're really not doing what you need to do because it's just not a one step beyond something else. And again, the tillage is the one thing Blake and I are both going to talk a lot about no-till. Well, no-till is the start. It's the first step because you really can't be regenerative if you start doing tillage. In nature, tillage is a catastrophic event. Nature doesn't do tillage. And so that really screws up all the water and nutrient cycles and whatever. So we started first with getting the no-till thing going and with the diversity of the crop rotations, which is the first start. And that has stopped the bleeding, basically, but we haven't healed the patient yet. So we're still a work in progress to get the rest of this done. But, you know, we're working at it. I don't, I don't, think we can probably do it without including perennial crops because of the deep rooting things, especially in places that were woodlands. It's going to be really difficult without doing perennial someplace. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I would sort of back that up a lot with what Dr. Beck is suggesting and that I believe regenerative agriculture has to be a soil centric focus. Everything has to circle around soil, soil management specifically, not necessarily a reductionist thinking perspective, like not, not necessarily saying we need to use less of all inputs, but definitely having a conscientious decision that we might not need everything that is suggested to us in the past. And definitely diversification, I'll back that up 100%. I'm a very, very strong believer that diversification away from these annual rotations of monocultures needs to have a real definite need of emphasis 
So today in our landscape specifically, we have three monocultures in rotation, corn, soybeans, winter wheat. Since we started using these big diverse cover crops in conjunction with no-till, like Dr. Beck says, no-till is just a methodology, but using that diversity, that biology that is stimulated from those living roots, that's when we start seeing these synergies start to really take place. And then we go one step further and uh, start utilizing a grazing ruminant and we get the biology that comes from that animal. Then we start really saying, okay, we're doing something proactive. We're starting to regenerate and build the soil that's so important to the business that we're in. Thank you. So that takes us nicely onto the core focus of this episode, which is, of course, tillage. I would be interested to hear from your perspectives why tillage has become such a common practice in modern commercial agriculture. Um, And what are the sort of short and long term impacts of tillage and disturbing the soil in that way? So I'm going to go first and I'm going to I'm going to give my perspective. I think tillage is uh, it's easy. First and foremost, that's why it dominates the landscape. It's cause and effect. Uh, farmers, you know, still being quite a male-dominated profession, it makes them feel good that they're doing something proactive, right? It builds on their ego, perhaps. Uh, it allows them to beat their chest like a gorilla. As they drive up and down the field, seeing that they're in control, they can see immediately that they have done something in their minds productive. So they have turned the soil over. They've turned it black. It makes them feel like their job is complete because they can see that they have gone across the landscape and they have done what they set out to do. They have accomplished something straight away. It's totally within their control. And so, again, this profession, this profession of farming is a learned profession, right? There are still so many people that have learned the trade of farming vis-a-vis generational learning. Grandpa did it this way. Dad did it this way. Therefore, I do it this way. Yep. And if there is still generational wealth that drives the business, so if there's still older members of the farming business that are still at play, sometimes some of those people still make the decisions. The old adage, those who hold the gold make the rules, still applies today in farming, sadly. And so I see that that's a large part of what's going on out there. You know, again, people will come back to the fact of, well, I've got weeds to control. So tillage is the scapegoat to say, well, we can use tillage to get rid of these hard to control weeds. I think tillage still to this day reminds a a convenient excuse. Today, ignorance is no longer the issue. It's indifference, which is the largest problem at the field landscape, because we know the cause and effect. We know the damage that's occurred with excessive amounts of tillage. Yet many farmers still see it. And today on social media, you can see the great big clouds of black as night landscape with big wind erosion events through the Midwest, the United States, and various geographies around the world, right, when that are succumbed to drought. Absolutely. So you've touched on it a bit there, but could you give us a bit more detail on the the short term and the long term impacts of disturbing the soil through tillage? Tillage is to farming what fracking is to petroleum. So it's, it's really a mining operation in, in the way it began. As people started to farm, quit moving around and started to farm instead of being hunter-gatherers, they could speed the decay of the organic material and the release of nutrients by adding air or tilling the land. And unfortunately, that also, just like fracking, it increases the degradation speed. So the soils would degrade. So as you go around Europe or wherever, these older civilizations, Morocco, for instance, and places like that, you see where there was great civilizations or there were big castles. And and all of a sudden, the soils around that castle were degraded. And so the castle become abandoned. They went someplace else. And this really had in Europe had the big effect in the 1800s of civilizations there not being sustainable anymore. They couldn't really feed everybody. So they exported people to the Western Hemisphere in Australia and New Zealand. That's where my ancestors came from in that period of time. And they came here and and began to immediately mine the soils here. In the late 1700s, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, two of our famous early forefather people who were both farmers, were communicating, and Alexander Hamilton was in on that too, famous singer, (laughs) 
<laughs> so anyway, mu- musical guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, they they were having this big discussion that they had to do something to make farming in the eastern seaboard more dependable or sustainable, to use an old word, or they were going to have to look westward for new soils to mine. They basically were communicating about, well, should we try to do a better job or should we just go look for new stuff? And that was like in 1797. In 1803, the United States purchased the whole center part of the U.S. from France. So the answer is we're going to go mine. And they came here and started to do that. And very quickly, you know, within a century, we had the Dust Bowl, the huge problem with soil erosion, which is famous worldwide. And everybody says that's over, but it's not really over. We're still doing that kind of degradation. We just have gotten better at it. So what's the long-term problem? You can read Loudermilk's work on erosion. He was a a U.S. guy. You can read David Montgomery's work, a book called Dirt, uh, Erosion of Civilizations, which covers both Europe and the U.S. and other places. But we know that this is not something we can continue to do. It's a little bit like global warming. Everybody tries to ignore it. But tillage is just not an option. So I've gotten very grumpy in my old age in that uh, we just can't continue to do this. And we have stopped the tillage in the central part of South Dakota, but we surely haven't done the rest of the things that we need to get to where that system would be what I would call regenerative. So for a farmer who is currently tilling their land, what would their key motivation be to stop tilling? I thought for sure that their key motivation would be increased fuel prices, but that clearly isn't the case. As we see uh, where fuel prices are today, and I see so many people going across the landscape with copious amounts of tillage equipment, great big high horsepower machinery. So I don't really know what the cause and effect will be that will cause many of my contemporaries to look for an alternative methodology. I think that like most people, until they get pushed into a corner financially, are they really forced to contemplate change? You hear so many stories of various people that have adopted no-till in a great way, and it has been due to the fact that they have had a significant event that caused them to contemplate change. And until that happens, I think farmers are going to be forced to look at themselves in the mirror and take notice and say, well, what am I doing to my largest capital asset?" to an asset that belongs to everybody as society, right? I always use the analogy, when we drive down the road and we speed, we know that we're speeding, we're breaking the law. And if we get caught, we pay a fine. And in the same thing with tillage, perhaps, until we see a significant emphasis from our government that the soil resources are for the collective and they want to really swing a big stick. And what that stick looks like, I'm not quite sure 100% today, But I think there needs to be some form of government intervention to really put an emphasis towards the importance of soil for all of the collective citizens that reside in those countries. I don't think we're going to see anything really happen. Yeah, it's the preservation of soils, not only for this generation, but for following generations. That's the one that's difficult. I always say that nobody changes their eating habits until they've had their first heart attack. And... (laughs) And it's kind of that way, in my opinion, with these better farming systems. In the central part of South Dakota in the 1980s, we not only had a a really dry period, but we also had a period of very high interest rates and very high energy costs compared to what had been there before. And that was related to the Arab oil embargo and the formation of OPEC, which unfortunately just A lot of farmers now have no idea what I'm talking about when I talk about those things. But the people there were really desperate for change, and they'll say that themselves. So we offered them a better alternative. What they were doing in this area right here at that time was growing one crop of wheat every two years. And so they would try to, quote unquote, store moisture for a year and then grow a crop of wheat on it. These were my ancestors, some of them they're really doing is mining two years of organic matter to grow one year a week because the moisture savings wasn't all that much. And so they weren't using fertilizer in the old days. That wasn't something they had access to prior to World War II. But 
it really, like Blake says, it has to do with the need. The trouble we have with government programs is more that they're trying to keep farmers from having pain. So they have all these support structures, and at least in the U.S., these subsidized crop insurance things. And that prevents them from really having to change because that subsidy is there. For instance, in 2014, last year I did the calculations because it makes me so mad, but we spent $14 billion in the United States subsidizing crop insurance. We spent $2.6 billion on all the federal ag research combined. So think of that dichotomy that we're spending all this money to subsidize, allowing people to do the wrong thing rather than doing research to try to figure out how to do the right things. And in actuality, a lot of our farmers here, even though they're doing all this good diversity and whatever, they still ship out most of their product. It's put on a train and goes away. And that's just not acceptable because the nutrients go when that soybean or corn or wheat or whatever goes away, then we have to bring something back to replace that nutrient, which we can do in terms of fertilizer, but a better way would be to cycle more of that nutrient in place. That really is what is entailed in regenerative is a cyclic system instead of a linear in and out type system. So for farmers who are looking to adopt a no-till approach, what would be the key environmental benefits that they would expect to see in the short term and then what would build over time? I would think straight away, the environmental benefits are going to be water retention. It's going to circle right back to water, first and foremost. And that doesn't matter if it's water retention or water infiltration when you have a big rain event, specifically when you have freshly emerged crop. And I see it in our system, at least, our replanting need is a lot less when we have increased soil organic matter, because we don't get the same surface crusting like many contemporaries do. So you get a big rain event, say the soybeans or the corn is just freshly emerging and the cotyledons get trapped in a heavy crust. And we're not talking a lot of rain either. I'm seeing a lot of contemporaries will have a two-tenths of an inch rain event and will get the field so significantly crusted that they're out there having to replant, which is ridiculous. Like two-tenths of an inch is nothing. So when we have this no-till environment, we have increased residue on the surface, which prevents a lot of that. We have increased earthworm activity, which increases straight away water infiltration down into the soil profile. So we don't get surface ponding or water accumulation on the soil profile. And also we don't get water running off, we get water running in. So when the tap shuts off later on in the growing season and it's 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 plus something Celsius in high humidity and your corn's pollinating, well, that is a definite advantage to have all of that water that's trapped in the soil profile. And that doesn't necessarily matter if it's in the winter months either, because if you have residue, that allows you in our environment to accumulate winter precipitation in the form of that white stuff known as snow. I also see that as a huge benefit. So I want to try and trap as much water as possible and use that no tillage environment to my benefit. And I think straight away that that's the biggest advantage right there. It all comes back to water, how we hold on to it and how we cycle it. Yeah, the first thing is infiltration, and that's where we were focusing initially because of the irrigation, and that was such a good learning tool for us because we will apply 50 millimeters of water in nine minutes with our irrigators and have no runoff. And so the water is going in the soil, but when the water goes in the soil, it's going in, in the case of no-till, through macropores. So it doesn't saturate the surface, number one, and it also allows the air to enter and escape from the soil. So it allows the soil to breathe. That's the other thing that happens. Probably doesn't happen the first year or two unless you start no-tilling from a perennial. Put a perennial in and then no-till right out of the perennial into annual crops. But very soon you start getting a soil that can breathe so you don't see the water logging and stuff that you associate with rainfall events because the water goes in where it belongs and whatever. But, you know, the long-term thing that nobody talks about in terms of tillage is tillage erosion itself. The tillage tools themselves cause soil to move. And they cause more erosion than the subsequent rainfall and wind events. It's actually the tillage event itself. And this was really pointed out early on to me by Don Lobb from Ontario. And his son works with that, actually. But 
few weeks ago, I was at an event where we were on fairly sloping soils, and we took soil samples from all the way through what we call a catena, from the top of the hill going down the slope and to the bottom. And what we had there, and it probably had been farmed for less than 100 years, maybe not much more than 70. There was no topsoil anywhere that wasn't buried. So the topsoil from the top of the hill got pulled down the hill. And eventually, enough of it went down the hill that it they were pulling subsoil from the top of the hill down the hill. And so the bottom, the very bottom of the slope in the level area, was probably a half a meter of subsoil over top of the topsoil, and then more subsoil under that. And the rest of the landscape was all subsoil that they were farming. It's a very dramatic change in what's happened there. And that's a several thousand year screw up. And so, like Blake said, I think it really is important that the governments hop on this, but it's NRCS doesn't really recognize tillage erosion as one of their things they put into the universal soil loss equation. So it's not quite universal because <laughs> it doesn't include tillage. Because if they did, nobody could do any tillage. It would be excessive amounts of erosion in every landscape. And politically, that's not doable. And it's similar to the climate change thing. The politicians just don't want to talk about it. We're just going to ignore it and hope it goes away. And those are all related to each other. Because if we raise the air temperature, we're going to have carbon actually leaving soils that we've put it in, unless we change something else to make it more so. And we're going to have higher intensity rainfall events, which I think we've already seen. And all of those really necessitate that we have to do something better than we're doing now, not stay with where we're at. So this is a pretty critical thing, I think, in my opinion. Thank you. And what other benefits are people going to see if they start going for a no-till approach? For example, what are the economic impact um, of taking a no-till approach, both in terms of costs and in terms of savings? A new house. And <laughs> we, we went through that. You know, a new house and a green Um you know, one of the things, if you have no-till, low disturbance, no-till, and diversity, you see less weeds. Because weeds are Mother Nature's way of what we call weeds. are things that when there is a big disturbance, like landslide or a earthquake or volcano, they, you have these species that come in and populate that denuded soil. And that's what we have with tillage. We have this denuded soil. So then the weeds come in and they're the ones that are best adapted to come in and take over that kind of landscape. And to be fair, a lot of our crop plants were species that started because of disturbance and we selected them to be something that we could eat. And so everything we have out there is more of a bare landscape type animal to start with. But if they manage it correctly, they'll see way, way less weeds because you're not reseeding them and you're not digging up old ones. So you can actually control your weed seed bank really well. So we use way less herbicides than a conventional guy would. And we don't have the issue with resistant weeds. We haven't used an insecticide. This would be the 19th year on the main farm. We haven't used a broadcast insecticide because we have lots of predators. If we would use an insecticide, then we would kill our predators. So we'd have to go back and start using insecticides again. And I think that's what most people fail to recognize, too, when we use these uh, broad spectrum, either they're herbicides, not so much, but insecticides, definitely, and fungicides. What are we doing to these beneficial organisms, whether they're beneficial fungi or whether they are beneficial insects? Because a lot of those are the prophylactic approach, right? They're broad spectrum. They're non-selective. And so you're wiping out your pest. That's the idea. That's why you're sold the product from the outset for fear that you're going to succumb to one of these pests and without any concern whatsoever for what beneficial organisms you might be disrupting. So in my case with no-till farming, because we're so humid, like I said at the outset of the conversation, we always run the gauntlet of having some slugs here. When seed dressings came to market with insecticide, slug pressure went through the roof. Because then all of a sudden we started wiping out our beneficial community of things that we didn't really take the time to pay attention to before. But then right away, right, slugs went through the roof. We didn't have the presence of carabid beetles that are predator insect or ants or anything like that. It's just cause and effect. So I'm like Dwayne, you know, those are some of the things that I observe as well. Weed pressure in our environment is definitely not perfect, but I think it's different, right? We see some sort of shifts in weeds, perennials, for instance, 
tend to be more of a challenge for us in our landscape. Dandelions, some wild carrot, which aren't necessarily bad. I think I sort of start looking at weeds as a bit of an indicator species of way I can address some fertility issues as well. So it's just the way you look at things. Absolutely. You definitely use less fuel. You definitely use less time because you're not doing the tillage. I can't imagine doing tillage. It would bore me to death um, to go drive up and down. And with auto steer, I mean, okay, so now I can get a tractor to probably go do the tillage for me and I can stay home and watch a football game. But all of those things come with the cost. But the biggest thing we saw, it it's not necessarily the fuel alone, although that's a reduction. I always kind of joke that versus a guy who was doing wheat summer fallow, we probably spend as much money on fuel as he does because we harvest way more crop and we have to haul it to market. So, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's a good fuel use, but it's um, in that fossil fuel neutral thing we're going toward. You know, the first part of that is reduction in fuel use, and then we're going to shift from fossil fuels to biofuels and renewables, and we're in the process of doing that now. Yeah, so tell us a little bit more about that. So Dakota Lakes Research Farm is trying to go fossil fuel free by 2026, is that right? Yeah, well, fossil fuel neutral. Um, there's a kind of a difference between neutral and free. 80% of what farmers spend on non-land costs can be traced to fossil fuels. It's a huge percentage. And if we're going to say, well, in 20 or 30 years, we don't want to use fossil fuels anymore. We have to stop using them. We're not going to quit farming. So how do we reduce what we're doing with fossil fuels? And then how do we switch over? Mm -hmm. So we already produce enough bio oils to meet our liquid fuel demands. So we can replace that with bio oils if we had engines that could burn them, which they do in Germany. We don't have those in the U.S. for political reasons. We can trade that oil for diesel fuel. We'll think we'll be able to burn SVO relatively soon. There's certain oils we can't get, probably won't be able to get, like hydraulic oils or something made from biofuels. So that's where the trade comes in. We're putting up our solar arrays right now. So our, our machinery buildings and office and all that area will be basically zero energy, fossil energy. That'll all be done with solar and batteries. And some of that battery is going to be hydrogen. We're going to have electric pickup, an electric car, three electric SUVs. So that's already in the process. All this stuff isn't all that hard. The reason we do it as a research farm is because we see this you think of strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats. It started back in the 70s. The biggest threat we have is our dependence on fossil fuel for everything we do. And that's a big threat. Our opportunity is sunlight is going to come every day. You know, we don't have to buy that from somebody. We have to learn how to capture it. But at Groundswell, I looked up the total energy used on Earth in total year 2012. And I gave that in exajoules which is a big number. And then I looked at how much sunlight energy falls on the earth in a single day. And the amount of sunlight energy that falls on the earth in a single day is somewhere between four and 1200 times as much as the fossil energy used in 2012. Right. So what's the problem? One day of energy versus a year. I mean, it's just a matter of changing our approach and we're attempting to do that because we're family farmers that really want our kids to be farming 100 years from now. And if they're dependent on fossil fuels, they're going to be in trouble, I think. Yeah, it's good for us to identify the problem because there's some problems getting there. And that's why it says research on the gate. Exactly. Yeah, that's what research <laughs> is all about. So I'm keen to understand a bit more about how you're actually measuring what you're doing on farm. So the techniques that you're using to understand the impact of the no-till systems that you're using. That's an awesome question. And so I'll, again, it comes back to water and what impact are we doing and what are we seeing? And I was fortunate a few years ago to be chosen for a Nuffield Farming Scholarship. And what compelled me to apply was the ongoing issue here locally with blue-green algae in Lake Erie. And why I was compelled to put my name in the hat to be chosen for a scholarship is that they were vilifying no-till. And they were vilifying specifically the earthworm that was providing conduits to tile drainage and ultimately carrying nutrients, uh, both phosphorus and nitrogen, out to the lake and then creating these problems with these ongoing blue-green algae blooms. 
So we've set up edge of field monitoring between my system with no-till and cover crops, and we're comparing it right across basically a rural intersection to my neighbor's farm using primary tillage and no cover crops, obviously. And so right away, we're seeing a reduction of phosphorus and we're seeing nitrogen that's lower. We're seeing the return, again, like I said at the outset, to the way the soil and the water functions. We have less land overflow straight away because we're capturing that data by the edge of a what they call a flume. When you have these big rain events and you get land overflow, then the flume actually will capture sediment that goes out in that water as well. It's very easy to target tile drainage because it's in a fixed location. But so many times when we have these rapid rain events that are becoming more and more commonplace, to really pinpoint the location, especially in a flat topography like ours, where you're going to see that land overflow and put your device there to measure that, it's very difficult. Nonetheless, that's some of the preliminary information we're seeing right now is that we're using less fertilizer, our soil indices are going higher, contrary to the other juxtaposition, right, with the tillage. So that's what we want to see. That really, at the end of the day, the no-till with cover crops is a definite benefit. Like I've said at the outset, we're not seeing the soil losses as well. So I think that really... In our system, I'm happy with that because at the end of the day, I definitely don't want people to say to me that I'm part of the problem. I would much rather be seen as being part of the solution. Absolutely. Yeah, if we're doing a better job of capturing water for us because we're in a relatively dry area and then using that to grow a diversity of crops, the bottom line is the farmer should be able to make more money. You know, we did a lot of work building the components to show him how to put which crops follow which crops and the best and how to make that thing work. That's what we focused on. And then building that into a system. And the farmers have been pretty good at building that here. I worry, like I said, about making that next step, because if we keep doing what we're doing now, what's it going to look like? And 100 years or 200 years or 600 years. And I think farmers need to ask them that themselves that question. And all you have to do is go to an old fort someplace like at Bulawan <laughs> in Morocco, where it was, you know, a big fort there and there was, it wasn't anything but eroded soils all around. And so it no longer was functioning. It's all about can the landscape function and people are part of that landscape. And the native animals are part of that landscape. I don't think we're going to put bison and elk loose on our fields here anymore. I, that has to be done a bit differently, but they should be able to survive there if they weren't so tough on fences. But we have had moose and elk come through here. We've never had a, a wild bison come through yet. And so to finish up, for somebody who is looking to convert from using a tillage approach to no-till, what challenges would they expect to face in the first few years? And how would you advise them to get over those challenges? Aside from vilification from their peer group, um, I would encourage them to reach out proactively to many practitioners that are found throughout the world. People that inevitably live in their backyard, in most cases, right? That aren't that far away from home where they reside. And don't be afraid to ask the tough questions. Make some observations ask them what compels them to keep doing what it is they're doing. Like Dr. Beck, like ourselves, like I've been no-tilling, I've been fortunate enough to be no-tilling since the 80s. When I say I, my dad and my two uncles, 1983, we started and I didn't know any better coming home from university because we were already doing this. So we've been at this game for a while. Financially, we're still viable, I guess. And I was fortunate enough, my wife and I, if we use uh, Dwayne Beck's uh, goalpost standard. We built a new home here, my wife and I in 2014. And, yep. and we're still, you know, we're still making a livelihood from this business of agriculture that I love, like so many of us love, right? And I'm more than happy to try and help people get to the next level to be unencumbered from this perpetual need to find themselves sitting in the tractor doing tillage. But I find myself laughing just recently this week as the Christmas flyer came in the mailbox from John Deere of all people. And, you know, that's the mentality. They start young and they want this youth to be enamored with big, shiny things. I would much rather have a red, shiny sports car, I guess, parked in my garage that I could go down the road and show off to my peers than worrying about going back and forth across the paddock. But an electric sports car, presumably. Well, perhaps. Yeah, Tesla, <laughs> that, would be, that would be okay. Or anyways, 
But that's sort of my perspective. And that's where I would suggest people reach out to the practitioners. I would always lean on the practitioner because the practitioner is invested with their own wallet. They're not invested by somebody funding their research. And in our case, my research that I do on an ongoing basis comes 100% from my own wallet. And I think that that in itself provides far more credibility than any other situation that presents itself. Thank you. Yeah, I think they can learn. The best approach is to watch people that are doing it. One of our first really successful no-till farmers who's still active. When people would come to him and say, okay, uh, I want you to teach me how to no-till, he would say the first thing you need to do is to go to Dakota Lakes and get your brain transplant. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and and they would come and we would talk about, you know, the difference between our approach where you're really looking at this ecosystem type approach and how do you fit into the ecosystem and how do you mimic the cycles and whatever. That's totally different than the, my wife and I were talking about this morning, most agronomists, if you called them up and say, I have this weed, they would say, well, you spray this herbicide on it. And that's where we're at. We're still teaching at our university. We're still teaching students that way, or we're still teaching entomologists that way. And the real way to approach that is when you see a weed, you have to understand what are the habits of that weed. And Mother Nature is an opportunist. And so if you have a weed that's a problem, you've provided that opportunity. And how do you take that opportunity away? What about the characteristics of that weed made it possible to fit into your system. And same way with insects is to understand them. And then how can you take that away? One of the things I did in my tenure as a college professor is I would go and do guest lectures at the university in the wintertime. And I would ask the students in the classes I was teaching that day, how many of them had parents or relatives that were actively involved in farming? And there were maybe half or less that actively were farmers. And I said, name their number one weed problem. And when they told me the weed problem, I gave them the tillage system and the crop rotation. And I never missed one in 17 years because they were providing the opportunity by what they did for their practices. Yep. It's a different way of thinking. And then once they kind of change their way of thinking a bit, then you start watching guys that are doing it. Because farmers are very, very good at this once they release their minds. Fantastic. Well, thank you both so much for taking the time to be on the podcast today. It's been a real pleasure talking to you both. Well, thank you for inviting me. Thanks for having me. Have a good day. Thank you for joining me today for the Region Agri podcast. To learn more about what we've talked about in this episode, please find the link to the Dakota Lakes Research Farm in the show notes. If you would like to know more about how the Region Agri initiative can help you on your regenerative journey from advisory services, monitoring of on-farm data and regenerative certification through to carbon verification, please visit regionagri.org. You can also check out our case studies and articles and gain access to our digital hub for free insight and advice. Alternatively, follow us on Twitter or Instagram at regenagri underscore org or search for regenagri on LinkedIn.